John chapter 19, verse 38, picking up where we left off last week. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with the spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was nearby. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out, and the other disciple, and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must, must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head, and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading from his word this morning. You may be seated. Over the, the last couple of weeks, we've been meditating upon the last couple hours of Jesus' life. Um, we began way back in John 13, verse 1, seeing the fact that Jesus had, we're told about Jesus that having loved his own, he loved them to the end. And we're looking at the very end at this moment. He, at that moment, loving his own to the end, showed them a great sign of humility in serving them by meeting their needs, by taking off his outer cloak, if you remember right, um, taking the, the towel of the servant and washing their feet, setting them an example of how they ought to serve one another. That was only the beginning of his acts of servants, service, if you would, in those final hours. Last week, we saw the fullness of it, where Jesus serve them, if you would, love them to the end, 
to the very completion of paying their price for their sins, their penalty of sins upon the cross. And we saw then Jesus make the statement, his very last utterance while on the cross, in the Greek translated tetelestai. Again, tetelestai is the perfect from the word teleo, but the perfect is a past action with a continuing result. Jesus declared, it has been finished. It has been perfected. It has been completed. It has been matured, whichever way you want to look at it. And that in that, we consider then how Jesus had fulfilled the scriptures about himself, how Jesus had fulfilled the law, how Jesus had fulfilled the payment for the sins, but how Jesus in that act also was declaring that we are, we are perfected. Not we shall be perfected, which is true from the when I get to be with him. But even right now, though I am going through a process of sanctification on the earth, I am in God's eyes already complete. I'm paid for. I'm done. There's nothing more that needs to happen. I don't need to add anything to what Jesus has already done for me. That's a pretty cool thing. Now, as Paul stated, again, I mentioned last week, Romans 5 going into Romans chapter 6, shall, shall I continue to sin that grace may abound? The response is, may it never be so. God forbid, meganate in the Greek, may it never be so, okay? So Jesus declared that it was finished. That then leads us to today, where God now brings the, the confirmation, if you would, that what Jesus actually did on the cross was accepted. That the sacrifice, the offering of Jesus on the cross was the perfect sacrifice. Remember, Jesus said at that point when he offered his, himself as a sacrifice, the sacrifice for your sin was completed. It sounds awful. It sounds weird. I mean, I know we, the, the resurrection is huge for us, and we'll, we'll talk about that. But the resurrection wasn't necessary to pay for your sins. You track with me on that one? Jesus stated that it was completed. He had fulfilled the law. The resurrection is the attestation that what he did accomplished what it was supposed to accomplish. And we'll talk about that as we go forward, as we look at the confirmation that happens here, okay? But on resurrection day, we always say, he has risen, he has risen indeed, hallelujah, right? But it hit me as I'm doing it, it has been finished indeed is really the, the, the what we're because for he has been risen indeed the him being risen indeed really just confirms that what he did for me on the cross actually accomplished God's purpose again you know I love to place myself um in the role of these in different individuals and there's so much so i can't miss out on what the resurrection means right but reality is coming through this whole passage there are a lot of principal individuals i almost had this message be the principles p-a-l and the principal p-l-e and so because you got these pr people who are impacted all through here and, and they're, they're, and they're, they're living this thing out. We study it again afterwards. And so first thing I want to do is I want to look at the impact of the event. First of all, with Joseph and Nicodemus, they're non-players, but they're huge players. Think about it. They're not the disciples. They haven't been hanging out with Jesus. Okay. Who are these guys for them? This is a time to take a stand. Now, this isn't the resurrection. This is in the burial part. This is the in-between part. But they're the guys we talk about in the in-between part. Where's Peter and John? They're not asking for the body. They're hiding. Yeah, where's Philip? Where's Bartholomew? Where are the, Where is this disciples at? 
They're not the guys who asked for the body of Christ. It's Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. Well, who are these guys? First of all, they're members of the Sanhedrin. Joseph of Arimathea, we're told in Mark 15, was a, was a prominent council member. Prominent. So he was in the council, and he was well-known and well-respected. We're told as well, we'll see in a moment, that he was also a rich man. But note as well that he himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. And they were told, coming and taking what? Courage. Why? Why, why was it coming and taking courage to ask for a dead body? What was he doing? He's, he's taking sides. He's taking a side. He's making a stand for Jesus. Okay? Um, we're going to go through the other verses. We'll come back to it. Okay? Um, so Joseph, again, council member, good and what? Just, important thing to know about this guy. He's a just man. He's a prominent council member, but he's also a just man, okay? And he what? Had not consented. So when that council was meeting together, determining what they're going to do with Jesus, guess who was there? Joseph was there. And it wasn't a unanimous vote. There were guys there who were opposed to it. But what do you do when you're opposed to it and you're being squashed? Well, for Joseph, he did what he could when he could. John 7, the officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, why have you um, not brought him? The, the officers said, no man ever spoke like this man. Then the Pharisees answered, are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is a curse. Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, said to them. So who's Nicodemus? He's also one of the what? The council. He's one of the officers that were sent to arrest Jesus. But when he comes to Jesus, the second time, right? This time's in the temple. He looks at it and he says, what? This guy, this guy isn't worthy of, of what, what's happening here. In fact, it's Nicodemus that, so John 3, right? And we're not going to go back and read all that. You can go back and read verses 1 to 21. Who comes to Jesus by night. Why do you think he comes by night? A little bit of secrecy there, right? Okay. He's interested. This guy is doing things. That's what he says. No one can do these things unless they're from God. Right? And Jesus turns around and says, you must be born again. Cut to the chase. You need to be born again. What do you mean by that? You need to be born of the water and of the spirit. You must be born again. He says, I don't get it. And so you go with this whole conversation. But Nicodemus is yearning for the things of God, just like Joseph is yearning for the things of God. They're both kingdom seekers, okay? And so we're told that they were also then secret disciples of Jesus. I want you to think about that, that concept by itself. A secret disciple now, when evening had come, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. In John 19, verse 38 and 39, which um, Chuck just read for us, we read um, that both uh, Joseph and Nicodemus had come and that they were secret disciples of Jesus. I'm mindful of John 8, verse 31 and 32. Then Jesus said to those Jews who what? Believed him. Were these two of those guys? If you abide in my word, then what? Then you're my disciple indeed. And, the, 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 and you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. These guys have been battling, battling for a few years now, on who Jesus really is. And, and Joseph, at least specifically we know, and I think Nicodemus probably being there too, because Nicodemus took a stand in John 7 for, on Jesus' behalf, right? Aren't consenting to what's happening. And they're being grieved, I think, in their, in, in their spirit. But what is happening at this moment has forced them to take a stand. You only can go so far, and then you say, what? Enough is enough. 
when will enough be enough for you to take a public stand for Jesus? Now, I'm not saying you're not, but that's, that's what I get out of this. This is my application for Bob. When is enough enough that I'm willing to take a public stand for Jesus? You can't be a camouflaged Christian. When you seek to blend into the world so no one knows, that means you're starting to look like the world. You're acting like the world. You're smelling like the world, if that makes sense. There comes a place when those who are his got to come out of the closet. And you need to take a stand. For Joseph and Nicodemus, they got a lot to lose. Joseph is a rich man. Nicodemus probably is rich. We're not told how much he owns. But they're both prominent council members. What do you think happens to them now at this point? They're kicked out of the council. I mean, what happened? When, remember when the, the, the blind kid guy, 40, right? He was born blind, right? And so he gets his, he gets his sight. But why don't his parents want to affirm what's happened? Because they're they were told that if anybody took the side of Jesus, they would be kicked out of the, the synagogues. So Joseph and Nicodemus got a lot to lose. When Jesus dies, and they realize what's happening, they realize it's time to, time to take a loss, time to take a stand. Secondly, we've got Peter and John. For them, it's a time to renew their faith, Right? Where are they at? Well, well, Joseph and, and Nicodemus are doing their thing. They're hiding. Okay? They're secret disciples. <laughs> They're in their closet, if you would, right? And so they've been bold. Peter was kind of bold, but he blew it. He failed. He, he faltered. He denied Christ three times, right? And he goes and weeps. I find it interesting, though, that they gather together again. And they gather together where? In the upper room where they had the communion. Don't you wonder, I can't answer this, I, I, don't, I don't know this, okay? But don't you wonder if that upper room belonged to Joseph or Nicodemus? It was somebody's, it wasn't theirs. And so remember, Jesus told them to go in and you're gonna find somebody you know, walking with a water pot, right? Follow them when you get there, say the master needs your upper room, you know? And so, there was no challenge, no whatever. Oh, I can't do this. I just, in, in my mind, I'm thinking it's Joseph. I could be wrong. Maybe it's Nicodemus. Maybe it's somebody else. But I'm thinking that that's another one of those steps. Like Nicodemus had multiple little steps that brought him to this point where enough is enough. And do, if you saw the, um, the Jesus um, sight and sound performance a year ago, you'll understand this line. I'm wondering if Nick and Joe have been talking a lot together. Okay, because it, in that sight and sound is a, a, a statement that I just think is so cool, it's so profound. And it's, you know, they're, they're wondering, could this really be Messiah? And so Joe says to Nick, well, Nick, you know he's got to come in somebody's lifetime. Isn't that kind of cool? We think about that with the coming of Christ. You know, oh, I don't know. You know what? Jesus is coming back one day. And it may very well be in your lifetime. Wouldn't that really be kind of cool? I mean, so, so here they are. So we don't know. But for Peter and John, they're in the upper room. Maybe in Joseph's house. Maybe in Nicodemus' house. Isn't that kind of interesting to think about? Well, these other guys are doing their thing, okay? And so for them, I'm skipping Mary Magdalene for a moment. We'll come back to her, okay? Mary Magdalene goes to the, she goes to the, to the um, tomb, and she brings them back news that what? His body's missing. I went to the tomb, but the stones roll away, and the body's gone. For these guys, this was just like devastating, right? And so they run to the tomb, and the first thing they do is they see what? A missing body. Well, that makes kind of sense, right? I mean, there's a missing body. But what else do they see in the missing body with the, about that? There's an important detail we're given. Say again. The linens. the linens were still there. The linens are still there. 
Who is going to unwrap a dead body to, to, to perpetrate? It's not the Romans. Make sense? I mean, the Romans ain't going to do that. If someone's going to come and steal the body, they're going to take everything with it. The Jews wouldn't because they'd be unclean. Yeah, I mean, this is, all this is going on in here. It's a huge statement that's here. You've got the, the, the linen stuff just kind of strewn, right? It's all there. So they look in, and it's huge enough that for John, you know, he gets there first, he peeks in, and, and then Peter comes in and does what? He does the Peter thing, you know? And he flies by, just goes right into the, the, the tomb. John was the better Jew. He, think about it. He went to the tomb and he what? <laughs> Stop. Why? Didn't want to be unclean. And man, I go in that tomb, I become unclean. Peter, he, you know, doesn't matter. You have kids like that, the ones who kind of cross the line this way, and the other guy, you know, you know so John's kind of the, the, the toe on the line kind of guy, you know, and Peter's just running right. Okay. And so he goes in. So after he goes in and he doesn't die, you know, John says, well, maybe I can go in, right? So in John, it says, seeing what? Believe. He believed. Remember that next week when we talk about Thomas. Okay? So seeing, he believed. What did he believe? What did he believe? Well, he believed the prophetic testimony of Jesus. Jesus had declared over and over again that he was going to go to Jerusalem he was going to be scourged. He was going to be abused. He was going to be killed. And then he tells them that after three days, he would be resurrected. It was the sign, remember, that as Jonah was in the belly of the whale or the belly of the earth for three days, so must the Son of Man be also in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. And so that was the sign. And so um, in fact, the others, you can read all those, okay? In fact, the, the Jews even understood that to be the sign. In fact, that's why they asked for the guard. Because this, this guy said that he would die, and after three days he would raise from the dead. So can we have a guard that goes out there, seal the tomb, guard the tomb, so that his disciples don't come and what? Steal the body to perpetrate, Okay. So you've got the Roman soldiers that are there guarding the tomb, right? But the angel comes and, 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 and takes the body, or, well, doesn't take the body, but you know what I'm saying, resurrection of Christ, okay? The body's gone. And so the, the Roman soldiers see this, right? They're like dead people, but then they go back and talk to the council. Don't you wonder if Joseph and Nicodemus are there? We don't read about that. Wouldn't that be kind of cool? Would you just see them showing up that day, and there's probably the big big debate over those guys, because it's after the Shabbats, right? The, to me, there was the high, the high Sabbath of the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and then there's the weekly Sabbath, okay? And so they had two Sabbaths, so they probably wouldn't have met together, but this is the first day of the week, so they probably are getting together after this. They'll probably talk, and the first thing they hear about is what? The body's gone, right? I mean, they're getting ready to talk about Joseph and Nicodemus, I think, right? And it's, you know, what are we going to do with these, these guys, you know? And while they're, they're, while they're there, and maybe they're there, maybe they're not. I mean, I just kind of put myself there, right? And while they're there, all of a sudden, the, these Roman guards show up. The body's gone. And they're thinking what? I mean, you're, you're Joseph and you're Nicodemus. What are, you, what are you doing at this moment? Yeah! <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know? Go ahead. Yeah, go for it, Mark. Why would the Romans go to the council first and not to their commanders? Because, the, the, say again? Yeah, the hanging. Yeah, they, they're going to be dead. They're going to be dead. Because it was, if you lose a prisoner, you die. Yeah. So, so they were going because the, it was the council that wanted them there. Make sense? And so they have to concoct a story somehow. And their best um, uh, friend of the moment is the council member. That's at least that's how it's been put out. I think it sounds uh, palatable to me or appropriate to me. So, anyways, so yeah, so that's not original to Bob, um, but it's a good question. So, anyways, so Peter and John, it's a big deal. They see the missing body, and it's an attestation, a confirmation for them of everything Jesus has stated. But I want to 
deal with this one real fast because there's a lot that's stated about the napkin or the handkerchief that was on Jesus. So you have the, the shroud of Turin and, and all this kind of stuff. And, 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 and you, on the internet, and probably through your email, you have gotten multiple different stories about how the folding of the handkerchief, the folding of the napkin has proven two things. I know of two different accounts of it that, have, that I've read, and they sound really good. One is the carpenter. When he's done with his work, he takes his, his, his apron and he folds it up and he places it aside and he says, my work is accomplished. And so everybody says, oh man, see, the work is done. Jesus, and the other one is that um, in Jewish tradition that at the dinner table, um, you know, the, 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 the servant will be off to the side waiting to come and take care of them. And so if the, um, if the, the master was done, he would take his napkin, he would ball up and he would throw the, the napkin on the table and he would get up and he'd leave and then the servant would know he's done. But if the, ser if the, the master got up and he carefully placed his, folded napkin back on the table that he would know that he's coming back. So that side says, Jesus was making a statement saying, I'm coming back. Sadly is, neither one of those are accurate. Okay, so if, if you've held to that as a clinger point for what you're believing theologically, don't go there, okay? Neither one of those are true, okay? Um, those are just internet spins, okay? Um, Anyways, before that email, anyways, you're going to all those email things. But so regarding the handkerchief, first of all, we, it's the Greek word sudarian, which, which comes from the Latin word sudarium, okay, which is a sweat cloth or a towel, okay? And so you can see these other passages where it's being used. Um, specifically, it is used as a, a, a wrap, okay, on um, specifically, mainly on, on dead people, okay? You'll never, you'll never see it in conjunction with carpentry and that kind of stuff. Regarding it being folded, actually, it is actually wadded up. It's twisted up, okay? And specifically, the word is used um, regarding um, winding up Jesus um, and then, um, oh, come on, Lazarus, okay? How they're wrapped up in a linen, okay? So the idea is that it is not even folded up. That's not even a proper rendering of the word. It's not folded. It was literally wrapped up, twisted whatever is literally what the word means, to entwine or wrap up, okay? That's what it means, okay? So um, Luke 24, verse 12, Luke's version of it, he doesn't say that the, the napkin was folded and set off by itself. Rather, he says that the linens were set off by themselves. In other words, the rest of the, the stuff that Jesus was in, okay? So what's the point? The point is Jesus wasn't there. Do you get it? That gone okay what is the why is it why are we told that this was twisted up by itself you know as much as i know we're not told so word of god says that which has been revealed belong to us and our children forever but the secret things what <laughs> belong to the lord why why do we have to make more of something that he just chose not to tell us about my faith isn't isn't founded upon a folded napkin Okay, what do I know? Well, I know that there was a separate thing that they wrapped around the head than they did around the body. That's what I know. Okay, and so if somebody was gone out of it, that thing would have just laid down. Okay, why is it folded? I can't answer the question for you. Does that make sense? Okay, all I know is Jesus wasn't there. And that was what was exciting to James and John. Okay, or James and John, um, <laughs> Peter and John. Okay. The life of Mary Magdalene. Um, it's a time to recognize who Jesus truly was. This is an important thing. Um, in Luke 8, this is where we read about Mary Magdalene for the first time. She's a woman who had been, um, had seven demons cast out of her, okay? She loves Jesus for what Jesus has done. It's kind of like the, the demoniac of the Gadarenes who had a legion in him, theoretically a thousand demons in him, right? Jesus removes them all in a heartbeat, right? Boom, they're gone. They go into the, the swine and the swine run into the, the Sea of Galilee. What do we know about this guy? All the, the town, these guys, the, the swineherds leave, they come back with the people from the city and what do the people from the city see? They see a guy in his right mind, clothed, okay? Apparently Jesus had extra, extra clothing with him on the boat, right? And so he's clothed and he's in his right mind. What does this former um, demoniac want to do? 
He wants to go to Jesus with Jesus. He wants to follow Jesus. He wants to be with Jesus. Think about it. From my perspective, I've lived the other side of the railroad tracks. I can't say I was a demoniac. Make sense? But I know where my life was and where it was heading. And I know what Jesus has delivered me from. I want to be with Jesus. That's where you want to be. If you, if when Jesus has delivered you, that's where you want to be. You don't want to be with the world. So Mary follows Jesus along with Joanna and, and some of these others who have been delivered by Jesus and have been healed by Jesus. And now some of these women were told, Joanna, the wife of Clisa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and others, they helped provide the funding for Jesus's ministry. They were the behind the scenes. Think about it. Peter's no longer doing what? Fishing. He's not catching fish anymore. John's not. James not. Andrew's not. So their livelihood is gone. Somebody has to be funding, quote unquote, the ministry. Does it make sense? Okay. So behind the scenes, you have these women who are doing it. How is Mary of Magdalene participating in this? I don't know. All I know is that she's hanging out with Jesus. Maybe she's doing the cooking for him. Maybe she's doing other things for him. She's, she's sticking with him. Okay. She's traveling with him. He's got a large grouping entourage that's following behind him with him, okay? She's part of that, okay? So that's who she is. She happens then to be the first one to go to the tomb. Now, some of the accounts say there was a couple Marys that went, okay? And so, but we, all of them have this in common, Mary Magdalene's there, make sense? And so she goes to the tomb, and the first time, clearly there's two times that she goes. The first time she goes, what does she see? No, she sees an empty tomb. First time she goes, she sees an empty tomb, okay? And so she doesn't know, because she comes back all concerned. They've taken his body, right? And we don't know where, okay? So then she goes back with the, um, with the disciples. So the first time she comes back, it's a time of despair. This is the guy that she loved. This was, we're going to see in a moment, who, who does she recall call him when she sees him? Rabboni. Rabboni, that is to say, teacher. He's her teacher. She loves him. He's the teacher. Do you get it? I don't think she's getting it fully yet, who he really is. He's not just Rabboni. He's Adonai. You get it? She comes back. They've stolen his body. Again, she's not getting it. If she understood the whole prophecy, she'd under, she would have come back joyous. He's what? He's risen. He's risen. No, they've stolen his body. We don't know where it's at. That's why Peter and John go running, right? Because they don't get it either. But then she goes back with them. They see, they take off. She lingers. She hangs out. She sees the two angels, right? Apparently, they, they tell her that Jesus is alive. And from the other accounts, and I'm not sure how to put all these together, being honest with you, okay? So I'm, I'm just like you are sometimes, you know, you put all these accounts together and you're like, oh, like this goes here and this goes there and I don't know how this plays out, okay? But she's still weeping. She sees the angel, she's still weeping because his body's what? Still missing. And I, I almost titled this message, Whom Are You Seeking? Not Why Are You Weeping, okay? But Why Are You Weeping comes twice. The angels say to Mary, what? Why are you weeping? Now, I'd like to think if I saw some angels who told me that Jesus was risen, I'd what? I'd believe it. I mean, whoa, this is pretty cool stuff, you know? She doesn't get it yet. You know, am I just seeing something? Is this just a, you know, something I, you know, one of these psychological moments, I'm not quite sure what's going on, you know, da, 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 da. And so she's still weeping. And then all of a sudden, the gardener shows up, quote, unquote. You know, think about that, right? So she's still in this state of just emotional um, whatever, right? And, and so Jesus, the gardener, quote, unquote, you know, he says, what? Why are you weeping? But then he adds to it more, more clearly, who, whom are you seeking? 
that really, Jesus has a way of really narrowing it down, doesn't he? To what the problem really is. Who are you seeking? That's your problem. That's why you're weeping. She turns around and says, Rabboni, right? Because she heard his voice. My sheep hear my voice and they what? They know me, right? So he hears, she hears the voice. She, he says, Mary. She turns around and says, Rabboni, right? And then she realizes what? He's just not a Rabboni. This is more than a teacher. Which Rabboni do you know that was raised from the dead? Do you get it? This isn't something that just a man does on his own. This is a God moment. And so Mary looks at him, okay, she says, whom are you seeking? She's supposing him to be gardener, says, sir, if you have carried him away. He says, Mary. She says, oh, Rabboni. And then, apparently, she did what? Say again? Went to hug him. Went to hug him. Went to worship him. I'm thinking, because he says, do not cling to me, for I have not ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them. Okay? I'm thinking maybe she fell on her feet, or on her feet, on her knees at his feet, right? That she's clinging to him, hugging him, embracing him, so exciting, okay, excited about the situation. And he says, what? You got to let me go. Because I haven't yet ascended to my father. That's for another moment, what all, how that plays out, right? This is kind of the in-between thing. Wait a second, what, if he was resurrected, what do you mean he wasn't with the father yet? And all this kind of stuff. I don't have an answer for you right now. So that's a whole new conversation, okay? But Jesus says, this is it. Then she runs back, rejoicing, telling them that she had seen. First time she goes back, she's all full of the Spirit. Why? Because he's missing. Now he's not missing. He's translated from Rabboni to Adonai in her mind, based upon all this. Now, we get into the, the, the more of the, um, the detail section of this. This is importance, if you would, than of the resurrection. The first thing is, as we've stated before, it's a confirmation. First, pure and simply, it's a confirmation of the offering, if you would, of Jesus, okay? And so if you've got your Bibles, you know, some of this may be a little bit, um, I have the verses up here. Some of them maybe from the back, it was hard for me to read. So if you guys have an issue with that, then you might want to get your Bibles. But 1 Corinthians 15, we have a whole lot of information given to us about the resurrection of Christ and the importance of the resurrection. So from verses 12 all the way to 26, um, we're going to be looking at those passages real quick. Um, but here, the first part is just to verse 19. It says, Now if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. So there are people in Corinth who were denying what? That people actually are resurrected, right? Again, that goes to the Gnosticism kind of thing that we've been talking about, okay? And so he says, but, Look, if that's the case, then Christ isn't risen. If Christ isn't risen, you know, we got an issue. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty or vain, futile, and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise up. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. You get it? If Jesus, that's what I'm saying, Jesus died for your sins on the cross, but the resurrection proves it, and it gives you the victory then over what? Over death, which we'll talk about in a moment, okay? So if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, you're still in your sins, then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have what? Perished. And so he sums it up. In verse 16 or 19, with the truth, if in this life we only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most what? Pitiable. If when you die, if when you die, you cease to exist, poof, you're gone. Why are you sitting here today? What a waste of your time. You can go do what you want to do because. When you die, you die. There's no judgment. There's no nothing else, right? You're just going to be dead. 
And you're not going to you're not going to exist anymore. You just go back into the the oneness of the of nature and the universe. Evolution, that's what they teach. But there is a resurrection from the dead. And so we see that as we come along, that there is this resurrection today, because Paul continues on then in this statement, in this line of thinking, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ what? All shall be made alive, but each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ that is coming. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God to God in the Father. The kingdom of God, the Father, when he puts to an end all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Do you get it? As everyone on the face of the earth has fallen under the sway of sin, how many? Everyone. Do you believe that everyone's a sinner? That means you're a sinner, right? Do you believe babies are sinners? Everyone's a sinner. I don't understand theologians who want to change the all in the next statement. There's, there's people who want to then say, well, the all only talks about believers. Do you get it? Jehovah Witnesses believe that. Jehovah Witnesses believe that if you know Christ, then you get to exist. But if you don't know Christ, you just poof, you have annihilation. There are those who read this as spiritual life. And they, 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 they read in spiritual life here, not just existence. And so they say, well, no, no, that's only talking about believers. Believers have life. Because we think to ourselves, every time we hear the word life, we think an eternal life, that we, we theolog theologicize it. I made up a word, okay? And, 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 and we think of it talking about salvation and being with God and that kind of stuff. How about eternal existence? Does that help you? Everyone has eternal existence. Humans, I'm not talking about animals. They're not made in the image and likeness of God. You are made in the image and likeness of God. You are a spirit being. And so is everyone else who lives on this earth, whoever has lived on this earth or shall live on this earth. The individuals, the humans, they are made in the image and likeness of God. Therefore, they are eternal beings. When they die, they will not die. I'm talking physically. I'm talking about existence. Do you get what I'm saying? Okay. Sometimes we have that, that spiritual end of it. We think of life and death from that perspective. And you got to get rid of that for a moment. When you look at people, remember, those people are living a life. They're made in the image and likeness of God. God loves them. Jesus died for them. Whether, whether you like it or not, he loves them. He died for them. And he wants them to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Do you? Do you really? Do you, when you look at individuals, think about the fact that they're going to spend eternity separated from God, in darkness, in burning, the feeling like a worm is eating them? We like not to think about that part of it. But that part's true. Everyone, because of his resurrection, think about this. We think of the good part. Because Jesus was, was resurrected, he's destroyed the, the last enemy, which is death. And so therefore, I get victory over death. Therefore, I get to live with him eternally. That victory also confirmed the condom, eternal condemnation of many. Jesus said, wide is the gate that leads to destruction, and many there are that go thereat. Narrow is the path that leads to life, and few there be that find it. It's not to be toyed with. It's not to be held as less. When I go knocking on doors and I meet these people, even if they shut the door in my face, I still want to pray for them. Because they're going to die. They're going to go to hell. Not because they close the door in my face. But if they don't know Jesus as their Savior. And like Jesus on the cross, sadly, Father, forgive them for what? 
They know not what they're doing. But ignorance doesn't get you past the judgment, which is the next part. This is an importance of the resurrection. Because of the resurrection then, there is this confirmation of what Jesus has done. There is this then, this, this attestation that everyone will have life afterwards. But there then is built in this that we see theologically from God's word that this also then confirms the judgment that is to come. And so Romans 14, verse 8 to 10, for if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or we die, we are the Lord's for this end. Christ died and rose again that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Acts 17, verses 29 to 31. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, this is Paul on the, uh, Mars Hill talking to all those pagan um, philosophers. We ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he's appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance to this by, to all by raising him from the dead. So Romans 14, predominantly talking about believers coming before the judgment seat of Christ, but he says that he is also the Lord of the what? The dead and the the living, so he is a deny over all. And then very clearly from Acts 17, Paul is talking to pagan philosophers. And he tells them, look, God may have just winked his eye, may have just kind of let you guys get away with this, but now through Christ, because what, what he's done in Christ, he's raised him from the dead, he's letting you know, he's stamping the fact there is a judgment that is to come, and you will give an account for whether you believe it or not. That's why Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, when he talks about the judgment seat of Christ, he says, therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. That's why he's out there. That's why he's, he's battling these guys, these philosophers. Not battling, but to them, it, it really becomes a battle, right? But he wants to present them with the truth so that these guys have the opportunity to come to know Christ and not face the wrath that is to come. Next, and finally, it's the sanctification of the saints. That this resurrection again, we talked about how Jesus said in, in his high priestly prayer for us in John 17, that his prayer to the Father was to sanctify us through his truth. His word was truth. Jesus' desire is for us to be continually set apart to him. So as we're studying First Peter, right, in Sunday school, part of what um, we just read this morning is that be ye holy, what? For I am holy, even as Yahweh is holy, right? So that's ultimately God's desire is for us to be perfect as he is perfect. Romans 8 is very clear by telling us that we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. But then he talks about for those he did foreknow, he also did predestine to be conformed to the image of Christ. Jesus is God in the flesh. Perfection in the flesh. That's what God's desire for us is. And so that's, I think, what Paul's talking about, Philippians chapter 3, when he says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high call of God in Christ Jesus. He's pressing toward perfection. He already has it. He already has it. I'm already perfect. But on the earth, I'm being what? Perfected. I'm being set apart. I'm being sanctified. I'm being made holy. I'm being renewed continually in the image of Christ. Ephesians chapter 4. You can look at that as well. But in Romans 6, verse 4 to 11, we see, therefore, we, are, we were buried with him, that is Christ, through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in the newness of life, that when I come to know Christ as my Savior, that there is a part where my old man, what? He died. And all things should become new. For we have been united together in the likeness of his death. Certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives... He lives to God. 
Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then in Romans 8, we read, And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. That because Jesus rose from the dead and he had victory over death, and the, the victory over death, do I have 1 Corinthians 15 up here next? I do. Okay, at the very end, O oh death, where is your sting? O oh grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, and I appreciate it. You started that, Zach, when we're doing communion. Victory in Jesus. That's what it's all about. Look, it's not just victory over death, but death became because of sin. And so that's what he accomplished on the cross. You get it? So the resurrection comes because he already conquered the sin. He paid the sin debt. Now all of a sudden, there was access to the tree of life. You get it? That tree of death becomes the access point for you to come to the tree of life who is Christ himself. It is through what he has done for you that you can truly live. If you're still living like the world, you haven't experienced true life yet. It's when you're ready, willing to go out on the edge. We talked about that a little bit this morning with Peter, you know, but Peter had to make a decision. To, to trust Christ. I mean, Jesus said, follow me and I'll, I'll make you fishers of men. He had, a, he had a decision to make. He was walking away from his livelihood. Who's going to feed his family? He had a wife. He had a mother-in-law living with him, right? So he's got people to feed. Who's going to feed them? Who's going to take care of them? But Peter and Andrew walk away. James and John walk away. And the God who is our provider and protector does what? He provides for them. God wants you to be set apart, to look like him. That means you have to walk away from what you knew before. The old man must be put off, and the new man must be put on. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 tells me what? I'm a new creation. Old things have been passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So, are you a disciple of the Messiah, of Jesus, the Christ? If so, are you a closet disciple? Do every, does, does, not do, does everyone around you know who you stand for? Not because you say, hey, I'm a Christian, but would they know it? just by your words and your actions, because you talk about them. And it may be that you make a stand saying I'm a Christian, but it probably is going to be more because of the fact that you are talking about Jesus all the time and that you're living Jesus out all the time. Or are you trying to contain it so that you don't have the negative repercussions? Do you truly believe that Jesus is risen from the dead? I, I get it. Um, I'm in, a, I'm in a, an assembly that probably all of you would say, yes, of course I do. But again, how do I know that? And again, you got to understand, these are questions that Bob asks Bob. How would the world and those around me really know that I believe Jesus is risen from the dead? What evidence is there in my life? What evidence is there in your life? What impact has it had upon your life and finally, then, is there a need to change the way you think and therefore change the way you act? Father, thank you for you. Thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you again for the, the resurrection, which you have um, brought by your own power. You raised Christ from the dead. And yet, Lord, I recognize the fact that you, Jesus, you've said that um, the Father gave you the power to lay down your life and to raise it back up. And so you are one 
in all things. And so I rejoice in you for that. Thank you that that resurrection wasn't just for you, but that you then applied the victory to all people. Lord, I do think of then those who are in my family, those who are in my neighborhood, those who are in this surrounding neighborhood here where we meet, and clearly millions around the world who don't know you. And my heart grieves, Lord. Uh, though there is a period of rejoicing that I have when I consider this, there is an overwhelming grief that I feel as well with the, of the souls who are dying and going to hell. God, I pray that you would help us to have the same desires that you have, that we would see that this resurrection isn't just for us, but Lord, that it's for all, and that you desire for us to be bold in taking your message of life, true life, and existence with you to those that we meet. Lord, and then allow it to be of a massive change to my life, that I would walk in your light and in your life throughout the day at all times for your glory, that whether I eat or drink or whatever I do would be done to your glory. In Christ's name, amen.